made a narrative platformer with emphasis on animation and story for the 7 days Xander Jam 6. And it was chosen to be the judge pick by both the judges. I tried new things and I'm happy with the result. Here's how it was made. Despite the success of my Vim Jam 2 game, I really didn't like the jump animation of the main character. So I decided to practice making jump animations. Something that was sleeping on my to-do list for a while was trying out rotoscoping. How could I better learn to do good jump animations than from actual footage of people jumping? So I made a couple of rotoscope animations based on footage of jumping people. Now that it was out of the way, I started to feel the need to scratch my game jam itch. I was looking for game jams on itch in January and found out the Xander Jam 6, organized by Xander Wood. I recognized that name from YouTube and from a cool game in Vim Jam 2, so it seemed like a fun jam to be part of. I rarely go into a game jam without having ideas in my back pocket or having a plan of what I want to learn or practice. My interest for rotoscope animation comes from what was called cinematic platformers. They were games with detailed animation and slow but deliberate movement. Games like Prince of Persia, Flashback and Out of This World. As a kid I was very impressed with the animation quality of those games and if I wanted to challenge myself to make better animations, those were the best 16 bits inspirations I could have. I tackled my last game jam with the intention to rank as high as possible. I went try hard, but I played it safe with my idea. I went for something I knew I could make. I finished third out of 412 entries and I was very happy with the result. Now that it clenched my thirst for victory, it was time to go back to my original reason to make game jam games, personal growth and expressing myself creatively. So for this jam, it was time to get out of my comfort zone. I'm a strong believer of the gameplay first motto. Meaning that if something non-gameplay related would hurt the gameplay, then it has to go. Things like a story constantly interrupting gameplay or a delayed jump to wait for the jump animation to play. But if I never try it, how would I know where to draw the line? So the Xander Jam seemed like a perfect opportunity to allow myself to fail and learn by trying something new that I would normally consider a bad idea. So before the jam starts, I do my usual planning using the height of technology and I'm ready for the team reveal. Survival of the fittest. I'm about to spoil the heck out of the game, so that would be your chance to go try the game and come back. It's a narrative game with a lot of emphasis on story, so spoiling it makes it less enjoyable. Survival of the fittest is obviously part of the theory of evolution. Meaning that an individual survives from being the most fit to their environment, kind of implying that the unfit does not. So I knew I had to have the player survive something that some other character would not. That's when I thought of what is probably the most memorable moment of Out of This World, when the player is chased by some big shadowy creature. I remember crapping my pants as a kid, playing this and recreating that feeling into a game of my own would be amazing. So the idea would be that the player and another character would be chased by a creature and the player being the fastest would outrun the other character, leading to the other character's death and the player's survival. Survival of the fittest, or in that case, the fastest. The shadowy creature also gave me an idea for the art style. I played a soul-like indie game called Unworthy and the art style is very interesting. The characters are silhouettes and most of the game is in grey tones. Since one of my goals was to focus on animation, only having silhouettes would allow me to make a lot more animation frames without having to redraw them with colors and details. Perfect for a game jam's limited time. Now I don't pretend to be a writer or narrative designer, so I tackle the story as a list of dependencies, things that need to happen for the end to be impactful. So I start with the end goal that fits the theme, 
The player must survive because they are the fastest. The player and the AI run away from a monster. The player is the fastest, so the AI gets killed. I didn't want to force the player to be a jerk that just throws someone to the wolves to save themselves, so the chase must not feel like a competition with the AI. I want the player to instead feel a weird mix of guilt, where they realize that the fact they are the fastest led to saving themselves for the cost of the AI's life. For it to have an impact, the subject of who's the fastest must be brought up a couple of times. There must be a friendly competition to establish that the player is the fastest in a fun, consequence-free situation, leading to friendly banter, making the final hit harder when it now has dire consequences. For the player to feel guilty about being the fastest, they absolutely need to care about the AI character, so the player and the AI character must talk to each other during gameplay. A mix of small talk to lighten the moon and banter about who's the fastest to hammer down that point. The AI character needs a name. Naming a character makes them turn from generic character to a person. I wanted the name to be relatable and easy to remember. I looked up popular American names and found out Alex, which is short and simple and easy to remember. The name also needs to be said multiple times, so the player knows who we are talking about when we talk about Alex. At the end, we must feel the absence of the AI. It must be clear that Alex is gone. The player and the AI will sleep in a shelter multiple times during the game. There will always be a cutscene of them sleeping and starting with the player waking up and calling for Alex so the very end of the game can be the shelter again, with the player waking up and calling for Alex by habit and realizing they are alone, making the player feel guilty and sad. Which is my goal, because I'm a horrible person. And for all of this to happen, we need a monster. The monster need to be properly introduced so it doesn't feel random. I'll need basic lore introducing the shades, as man-hating creatures. Since I was planning to put spikes everywhere, I thought I might as well tie it to an apocalyptic event, where the plants would take over the planet. The change environment led to the spread of the Shades, who brought the humans to extinction, and since there were no humans anymore, their own extinction. Making the two characters the two last humans on Earth, making Alex's death even more impactful and making the Shades also extinct, making them mysterious and legendary. But the player will know what that monster is when it finally shows up. The Shade should also be teased before the chase to build up tension. And last but not the least, the chase must happen during gameplay. It must feel like it's not only the character that the player is playing that is the fastest, but the player themselves so they must be actively running away from the monster, leading to Alex's death. Okay, now let's do this. Thursday, the first evening. As usual, I started with the character movement. I wanted the gameplay to be about managing your speed, so I needed to have both a walk and a sprint. The sprint having relatively slow acceleration and deceleration, so the player must be smart and build up speed before they can jump a gap or slow down to make a precise jump. Friday morning, I made a placeholder animation to play between the walk and the sprint, so the player can know that they are sprinting at full speed once they reach the sprint animation. During my lunch break, I made a ledge grab animation. After work, I finished the ledge grab. Then I made spikes, so the player has a way to die at that animation and simple respawn mechanic that only reloads the current level. Saturday, the first weekend day. I wanted the player to have opportunities to run and jump around to explore larger levels. Since the food is limited in this apocalyptic world, it made sense to make the player look up for food. So I made plants that would be used as fruit spawners and collecting them would be the objective of exploration levels. Now this game cannot work without our friendly AI, Alex. 
I decided it would save me a lot of time to make the AI simply a player character with a bunch of spaghetti to replace inputs by AI. So all the animations, the sprinting, jumping and ledge grabbing would work exactly like the player. So anything I would make for the player character, it would more or less work for the AI. While making pathfinding that would involve jumping at the right speed at the right time would be really fun to code, it would also take too much time for the scope of the jam. So I decided to make the AI check if they were off screen and teleport to an off screen position based on where the player walked on to be sure to teleport somewhere safe and somewhere that kind of makes sense. Then I tackled another very important part of the game, the conversation system. I dug out speech bubbles I created for my Nate Jam game that I also reused in my Vim Jam 2 game. I made it so that the bubbles would hug the side of the screen when the AI is off screen, allowing to also be an indicator of where Alex is. I also made different bubble art for the player and the AI and a different typewriter sound effect to help understand who is talking and make the characters slightly different since they are sharing the same art. Then I created a concept of conversation that can be triggered via a string. I would create a bunch of conversations that are a list of things to say by which character and for how long. I also made a concept of small talk conversations that are triggered at a certain interval only if Alex is on screen to allow flavor text that is not crucial to the story but helps building the player's relationship with Alex. Sunday, the last weekend day, I had another unlikely influence for this game. The Uncharted games often have friendly AIs following the player. They would chat with each other during gameplay and also make it possible to gate player's progression because they need the help of the AI to progress forcing the player to get rid of enemies because the AI is busy fighting them. It is way more elegant than the video game trope of a door magically opening once a wave of enemies is defeated. So following that idea, I made a kind of wheel switch that needs to be operated by both the AI and the player, but only when the AI feels like it. It allowed me to block the player's progression based on how many fruits they collected, allowing me to make a conversation triggered by the switch where Alex would explain that they need food for the night. I wanted the fruit collecting to be about exploration, so I didn't want to force the player to collect all the fruit. To avoid making them run aimlessly around the level because they can't find the last one. As usual, I was late on my plan. I was supposed to have all the mechanics by now. Something blatantly missing was the monster for the final chase. I wanted the player to be surprised by the monster and know they had to run. So I thought it would be cool to have the player looking for fruit and the monster burst out of the wall as the player is about to pick one, throwing the player on the ground, properly introducing the monster and give enough time to the player to realize they really should start running. I made the monster go toward the player and jump when near a gap. I wanted the chase to be scary but not actually hard. So I made a rubber band system so the bus goes faster when off screen and slower when near the player so the player feels in danger of getting caught by the monster. One last mechanic before I can focus on level design was the running and jumping AI so Alex can be part of the friendly competition and obviously run away from the boss at the final chase. Since the player needs to be the fastest, I reuse the rubber band system I made for the monster to slow down Alex when he's too ahead, while still mostly being on screen, so it appears to be a close race. The player could just not run and lose the race, so I decided to make Alex trip at some point in the race and fall on the ground. So no matter what, the player would win the race. Sunday is not over yet, so I pretend to follow my planning and start on the tutorial and flow of the game. So for the tutorial, I only add a couple of things to teach. The lore, here's your friend Alex, jumping, sprinting and jumping as taught by Alex himself. Spikes are deadly. 
Since the clock was ticking and I was supposed to be done with level design by now, not starting it, I decided to reuse my test level as the first exploration level. Here comes Monday. I made a shelter that will be used in between levels where the player would sleep for the night, allowing a moment to have a conversation to help the story. I added the shelter at the end of the first exploration level, starting the cutscene with the players waking up and calling for Alex, having them talk about how they are the last humans, but they still got each other. For the third level, I made the friendly race. Alex would get up before the player and tease the player about being slow. After some banter, Alex challenged the player to a race, leading to a cool sequence of having both the characters running and jumping around. The fourth level starts with the player bragging about winning the race and being arrogant about it. This level, the second and last exploration level, allowing for all the small talk to be about the player bragging about being the fastest and Alex being a sore loser. I wanted this level to be about freedom and exploration. So I made this level a lot bigger with a lot of branching paths and way more fruit than required. Since I made 3 levels by now, I took notes on what was fun to navigate and what were good metrics for jumps. So I drew the level using another miracle of technology before making it in Unreal. Since the tile map tool makes me swear like a sailor and it's really inefficient to design the level directly in it. Tuesday. The fifth level would be about teasing the monster. The fourth level would not end with a shelter and the characters would simply travel to a shelter later in the day to be interrupted by a big scream. I also made the monster quickly pass in front of the camera so the player feels like they're being watched, allowing for another shelter sequence, this time about the shades and how they're supposed to be gone. Sixth level is the chase. I wanted the player to run toward the shelter to close the door, so it made sense to let Alex sleep while the player gathers fruit so he can run back to Alex for protection, allowing an extra layer of guilt since Alex helped the player while the player didn't. To add to the surprise, I decided to add fake empty plants on the way toward the monster, so the player can think, oh, finally, a fruit, when they go toward the one that leads to the monster spawning. Seventh is the final. Sorry, Alex, it's your time to go. The monster bursts through the closed door, reusing the spawn animation. I had to carefully tweak the rubber bending of both the monster and the AI, so the player is slightly ahead at all times, but not too ahead, so that Alex looks like he should have been caught by the monster before the time he's supposed to. To be sure that the players don't feel too much like a jerk, I made it so that there's a final leap of fate at the end, with enough time to see Alex trip behind you, but it's also too late to help, because the player already jumped off. Then the end screen. At first I wanted to make a final encounter with the shade, where it would once again burst out of the wall, leading to some chase, allowing the player to somehow throw the shade into spikes and kill it. But. As I was trying to think of how to make Alex's death dramatic, I realized it would only ruin the dramatic effect if it was interrupted by a big monster bursting out of the wall. Plus there was less than 2 days left, it was time to wrap this up. So instead I made a little cutscene with the player in a pit surrounded by spikes, with the monster screaming, leading to the assumption that it killed Alex. Then the player says slowly that he is the fastest. It didn't make sense to make this cutscene without music. I used music from Steven Mellon and tried to link the final cutscene with the music cues. It switches to yet another shelter, this time with the player alone. The player wakes up and calls for Alex, like he's been doing in all other shelter sequences to only realize that he's alone. The end. A 
I finally had all my level design done. Yet, I still had a lot of work to do, but it was late. So since I already added music for the final cutscene, I focused on adding music. And God, that Steven Melian is really good. I knew that this game needed a good ambience to be effective, so it's the first time I focused on audio before polishing their art. Wednesday, last full day before the end. Since the level design was complete, it would have been a good opportunity to ask for playtesting. But since it was a game with not much focus on gameplay and more on story, I thought I would receive invalid feedback if the playtester played a non-polished game. You don't really need playtesting anyway, right? So I made all the menus, main menu, controls, level select, options and credits, also available in a pause menu. I tried something different for the name of the game and went for a single word, fast, to once again hammer down the concept of who's the fastest. It was now time for the reason I made this game in the first place. Animations. I made two versions of the sprint animation. I scaled the animation player rate based on the character speed, so the player has a better feel of the acceleration. I popped some reference for the jump and I ended up only doing two frames for the anticipation, one frame when rising, one frame on the apex of the jump and one when falling. I only play one frame at a time and in the code I would check when the character is in a certain up velocity threshold to play the apex of the jump. It was simpler than I expected and I'll definitely reuse that trick in future game jams. I made an ok walk cycle and a slow 2 frames animation for the idle. And finally a parallax background. Thursday. The last day, I had until 7 p.m. to finish on a weekday, where I'll also need to work to earn a living. The only thing missing was the shade animations. I already had a scream animation. I used running bears as a reference to make the shades running animation. I reused some slightly modified frames of the run for the jump, also with an apex frame. I added a couple of grunting sound effects when jumping and a slight camera shake when it lands so it feels heavy and scarier. Then on my lunch break I made a bump animation for when the player gets into the shelter, added a sound and a camera shake. And the very last thing I did was to make the shade stop when reaching Alex. The monster would sometimes go too fast and jump off the ledge at the end ignoring Alex, kind of ruining the idea that Alex has been caught and killed by it. After work, I tested the build, submitted and made a nice itch page with animation gifs, but not showing the monster to not spoil it. Once the rating began, I started to receive very similar feedback. It was all about the jump and the difficulty. The delay in the jump would lead to people simply falling to their death again and again. It was very frustrating to miss a jump and since the jump anticipation animation was not very apparent, a lot of people mistook the jump delay with an input delay. Players would feel cheated by the game when they would press the jump button and the character would just not jump and they would die. And the cherry on top was that there was no checkpoints, so you would have to start over collecting the fruit when missing a jump. 
And since the fruit collecting was at the beginning of the game, a lot of people gave up early. I made a narrative game where most players didn't get to experience the story. Pretty much all the players gave me the same feedback. So it's pretty clear I would have known about it if I did any playtest at all. Friday morning, I got up at 5 a.m. because I could not sleep anymore. I was obsessed with the jump problem. Even though the jam was over, I had to fix it to reclaim ownership of my sanity. The problem was the delay caused by the jump and spatial animation. I could have just removed it, but I felt it would be admitting defeat and just make yet another platformer. I wanted to make it work within the constraint I gave for myself. So I made a system where I would check, based on the player's velocity, if the player would fall off a ledge during the time of the jump and spatial animation. And if they would, I would make the character slide backwards so the character would be right on the edge once they jump. It would not miss the jump and it would not allow them to jump farther like Coyote Time would. And during the weekend, I added checkpoints, so the game is a lot more forgiving allowing the players to focus on the story and the ambience of the game. After a week of ratings, the results dropped. I ranked fourth, third in art and graphics, and first place for sound effects and music. I understand the lower rating for gameplay and theme. The fun was clearly negatively impacted by the frustration of dying because of the jump delay. And since the theme only makes sense once you finish the game, the fact that a lot of people gave up before the end because of the difficulty probably made people not understand how it fits the theme. Yet, while I was making this video, the judge picks were announced. And my game was chosen by not only one, but the two judges. Thank you to Xanderwood and BlankDev for the honor. Now that I fixed the main issues of the game, I'm really proud of that game and it's a game I would never have made if I didn't try to get out of my comfort zone. It gave me a lot of animation practice, a cool idea for a jump apex, and it confirmed how crucial playtesting is. I'm still a strong believer of gameplay first, but that game would allow me to broaden my range of games I can create. If you want to try it fast, the link is in the description. I'm Rocky Mollet, if you guys want to try my stuff, you can check my itch page in the description.